And then I started to notice when I was practicing that, that I wasn't thinking about those obsessive thoughts. Somehow I made the connection that, mm. that placing myself in present moment awareness was more fun than thinking about that I might go blind or, or get, get paralyzed. <laughs> and and, and the, the thing was, I knew intellectually, like many of us know, that those were irrational fears. I knew, you know, I was a smart kid. I could figure out the odds against it were long, you know, and besides, what am I going to do to prepare for this? Learn Braille? I don't know. You know, <laughs> um, you know I'm just going to have to deal with it if, if, if it happened. But, but, um, um, but that, but knowing that, like we've all discovered, isn't enough, right? You can't, we can't talk ourselves out of obsessive thoughts. Um, but I started to realize that I could work with it in this way, bringing my attention back to the present moment. And to my amazement, I discovered that it took me about three months to train. Once I caught on to that, I started really training myself that way. And, uh, and it took me about three months to get over those obsessive thoughts till they really completely went away. Mm -hmm. Now, not everything disappears quite so quickly, but it definitely told me that there was something that that wasn't, the fear wasn't that deep-seated. I actually was an extrovert. You know, that didn't take care of all my fears by any means. But what it cured me of is the ha was the habit of worrying not just about those things, but in general of worrying about the imagined future. Because um, so I started to see that everything about the imagined future was the same. You know, it, it was, um, most of it was unlikely to happen. If it did, there was no way to prepare and, for it. Um, and most of it never came to pass. So, around that same time, boy, it was nice to all of a sudden not be worried, you know? <laughs> I have to say, big burden off, off one's shoulders. And, and, and what I learned was it was only my mind that was doing it to me, right? I never did go blind. I never did get paralyzed. Um, around the same time, I took a yoga class at the university. and. Uh, we were doing the corpse pose at the end, and uh, I suddenly noticed during the corpse pose that my mind wasn't doing anything. I was just, mm -hmm. my mind was empty. I was perfectly relaxed, yet perfectly alert, aware, and, uh, and it felt good. And I thought to myself, lying there in the corpse pose, this must be what meditation is, because I've been hearing about it. And I thought, I wonder if I could do this sitting up. And so I went home and I tried it, and I could do it sitting up. <laughs> And um, at first it was easy, um, for some reason, I don't know why. Um, there were lots of struggles to come later, but uh, so it's about the year I was 19, 20, I started occasionally doing meditation. You know, in being 19 or 20, there were a lot of other things to distract me, but I did, I did, um, I, we had a dark room in, in the group house I was living in by the time I was 20, and I used to like to sit in the dark room with the door closed. And, um, you know, it was the 70s in California, so weirdness abounded. But, but, uh, but still, when one of my roommates came in to develop some film and opened the, the, uh, the dark room door and found me just sitting there, and, well, I wasn't sitting there like this because I didn't know how to sit, and besides, my knees were about six feet from the floor, you know, I, could, I, I couldn't bend them down at all. Um, but anyway, they, they opened the door and see me sitting there in the dark. But it was the 70s, so I just say, I'm meditating, and they go, okay, okay. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I discovered meditation was cool, because I was listening to the Beatles. And, uh, and I was reading Jack Kerouac, and I had no idea how cool meditation was. So, so it made me want to pursue it more. Um, in fact, I finally um, wanted to, I, I always wanted to write an article about the Beatles and Buddhism because they had a lot to do with, uh, you know, turn off your mind, relax and float downstream, this is not dying. There's that song, Tomorrow Never Knows, with uh, lyrics from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And uh, um, anyway, I finally did write an article about 10 years ago for Tricycle called The Fab Four's Noble Truths. So. I got to, I got to repay that uh, that that uh, what I owed them for introducing me partly to meditation. Um, 
So um, now I want to tell you about something that happened when I was 28 years old, and it can be a little unseemly to talk about these things. And I feel really compelled to tell this story partly because of the conversation yesterday with David Loy. It has to do with the emptiness and that whole um, issue that he was that he brought up and was was uh, delivered in his talk. And uh, by this time, I, I'd spent about six months living in this fairly remote location on the California coast. I was uh, purposely, I'd graduated, I was only working part-time, and I was, I was just giving myself a lot of free time to write, do some meditation, be in nature. And somehow I happened upon this uh, practice of watching the entire sunset from beginning to end. It could take more than an hour until it was completely dark, you know, from the time the sun, and, and in California where I lived, it would set over the water, so the colors and everything were stunning. Um, very psychedelic, although I, I did take psychedelics when I was younger, but I was not taking psychedelics by that point. Um, and and I would just sit there absorbed and watch without anything to do except watch. Fortunately, there were no cell phones. There was no internet. I often wish for my students these days that they had that kind of free, untrammeled time that I had at that point. It wasn't hard to, it wasn't hard to make a living working half time in California at the time, and I had cheap rent and and uh, um, and no apparent sense of direction. I was just exploring my life, you know, and uh, and then we. My roommates and I had to leave that place and we moved to uh, a place on top of the mountains behind Santa Barbara and we were on this ridge and if you know the California coast you know how uh, a fog blanket can come in and there was just the most dramatic phenomena up on this ridge. Sometimes there would be a whole fog bank covering the whole coastal area and the sun would be setting into that fog bank because above the fog bank it was clear and then uh, on the other side of the ridge we lived on, it was the desert. And there was a rift right in that ridge. And sometimes the, um, the clouds from the one side would just pour in torrents over to the uh, desert side and then just immediately vanish because it was so dry there. And it was just a wild thing to watch. And I, again, I would just be absorbed. And I didn't realize that that absorption was what we now think of as samadhi, but it clearly clearly was. I was just being brought it and drawn into that. Uh, I guess I knew it was linked with meditation because I'd been playing with meditation. But and then I'd been I started started reading a lot about Buddhism and I was reading these books about um, physics and and Eastern philosophy and, and a lot of other things just more purely about Buddhism and Zen. And um, one morning, I still had this fundamental uh, fearfulness. I still had this fundamental existential uh, fearfulness, despite all that. And one morning, my roommates had left and uh, for the day, because they all had real jobs. I was just, um, anyway, I had the house all to myself, and, and I didn't have to do that. And um, and uh, so I'd just been reading about mindfulness. I thought, I'll try this thing called mindfulness. I didn't realize that I'd kind of been doing it already with the awareness practice I was doing before. It's so funny how these things can grow in one without really knowing what one's doing. In fact, maybe that's the best way, <laughs> you know, um, because it's not self-conscious. But I thought, I'll do this mindfulness thing. And so I started putting all my attention to the washing the dishes. David Loy also spoke about washing the dishes, didn't he, yesterday? And um, I don't know how to describe it, but all of a sudden, it was like, you know when your back's out, and all of a sudden it clicks back into place, and you go, ah. It's like, it was like life did that, as, as though my life did that. And um, I suddenly, looking at the dishes, I realized that they weren't anything what they looked like. They weren't actually this, this firm surface. 
that 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 we see with with color and form that they were actually um, and of course this is just science that they're act that this surf this hard surface is a in part an illusion created by molecules moving around very very quickly within a very big space so so things are actually objects are actually mostly space they're mostly made of space and if you dig down to the particles it's and dig further down and further down the particles become um, become inextricable from energy they're the same as energy right and it was as though that just clicked for me and I could see that and I looked I was at we had a window that looked out over the mountains I looked up over the mountains and I just realized the mountains were the same way they were mostly composed of emptiness and um, and then I realized well I must be mostly composed of emptiness and um, and then if this isn't a real surface then the emptiness in here must just bleed out into the emptiness out here which must bleed over into the emptiness of, of the, you know the chair and the steps and and uh, and kendo over there, and all the emptiness must run into each other, and um, and all that fear I've been carrying, all those years, it just dropped off, and uh, because everything was clearly connected, and part of the reason I want to bring this up. Well, there's several reasons I want to bring it up uh, to make Dharma points with, but um, one is that any kind of insight always brings delusion in its wake. And it's really important to understand that. It's really important to be watching for that. I think one of the reasons that we have so much um, difficulty and misbehavior among spiritual teachers is because one of the delusions that comes with any Deep in, transformative insight is that um, is that oh everything's fixed forever, right? Um, which is is not the case, <laughs> and um, and but also I want to bring it up because I give talks in a lot of different places and. Uh, a lot of different places, the sense that something miraculous that can, can happen through practice, I mean, that's still, in a way, the biggest turning point in practice that I've ever had, even though there, was, there were more things to come. But just having that fear, I carried all my life, just kind of slough off. It was really, and I've been through lots of trouble since, but, it's, but the fears never come back, you know. Um, and... Um, some of the, I, I speak with a little neighborhood group in Taos, and you know, they're all, they want to improve their lives, and they're all older people, and it makes them calmer and more clear-headed. And I don't think, I don't think there's the slightest desire to overturn their lives or be transformed by practice, or even a belief that it can really happen, you know. And, um, Anyway, I, th I think it's important to remind us that things can happen that are like that. Um, but to get into the delusion part, um, I was on a kind of cloud nine for about 10 months. And um, I would forget that everything was emptiness sometimes, but any time I remembered it, it's like the feeling would come back. And, and when I was in the thrall of that, uh, I decided to do this thing called the Great Peace March, which was a group of activists who walked across the country as a demonstration for nuclear disarmament. This is 1986. Mm -hmm. And we ended up walking more than 3,000 miles over nine months. And um, 